thank you everyone uh, and welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, for today's APAC Tech uh, digital discussion. My name is Justin Goldberg. I'm APAC's Director of Private Equity and Venture Tech. And I'm delighted to be leading today's discussion on tech investing and venture funding during this rather interesting and unique environment with two superstar investors who specialize in early stage startups, Bruce Tarragon and Karen Klein. Um, we will kick off the discussion in just a minute, but as always, we want you to feel part of the discussion as well. So throughout the entirety of the conversation, please feel free to submit any questions you may have for Bruce or Karen throughout the call. And you can do so uh, in the chat box privately to me or by sending me an email to jgoldberg, J-G-O-L-D-B-E-R-G at apac.org. Mm -hmm. And quickly before we begin, we want to get everyone involved right off the bat and take a poll of the room, uh, hitting on one of the themes of today's call. We want to ask you, in 2019, Israeli, firms, Israeli tech firms raised a record $8.3 billion. So in your opinion, will funding in the Israeli tech sector exceed last year's total by the end of 2020? And I see we've launched that poll right now, so feel free to weigh in throughout the call and we will share those results at the end. And of course, while everyone's weighing in, I'd like to remind you all that this conversation is off the record and close to the press. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our two illustrious panels, uh, panelists today. Uh, Bruce Tarragon is the Managing Director of Lumber Capital and has more than 25 years experience as a VC, entrepreneur, tech investment banker, and corporate attorney. And he also recently co-founded Mac Ventures, which is an early stage fund investing in North American and Israeli tech companies. Uh, and of course, Bruce is also a multi-time shark at our Shark Up Nation early stage pitch competition. Bruce, welcome. Thank you, Justin. Great to be here. Great to see a lot of familiar faces and uh, always fun to be here in this new world that we live in, I guess, virtually. Well, it's, it's a pleasure seeing you as well. And of course, I'd like to welcome our other panelist, uh, Karen Klein, who launched and leads East Coast investing activities with Bloomberg Beta. And before that, among the many, many accolades and accomplishment, uh, accomplishments, led new initiatives at Bloomberg and oversaw SoftBank's venture team uh, that reviewed new investments. Karen, welcome. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm also happy to get to spend time chatting with uh, Bruce because we've been co-investors for, for a couple of decades now. So it, and I'm excited for our conversation. We both started when we were about 13 years old, Justin, just to clarify that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Perfect. Well, we, we love the familiarity. We appreciate it. We know how uh, busy you both are. So uh, we really appreciate you taking some time out offering some analysis and predictions and so on and so forth. But let's uh, jump right in if we can. Um, you know, obviously, as we all know, we're in a rather unique, <laughs> possibly, hopefully once in a lifetime situation right now. Um, but Bruce, as you mentioned, you've been doing this since you're 13 years old. So, uh, you know, a few different, few different cycles. Um, where, where are you right now? Um, you know, what's your general investment strategy during COVID? How has that changed uh, from, from where you were pre-COVID uh, and kind of where do you see things uh, going in the future? Uh, Bruce, let's start with you. Sure. sure. So, Justin, thank you. And, and Karen, yeah, it's great to be on a panel with you as well. I think it's really been a long time since we've uh, co-invested on different opportunities. So it's great to, to be here with both of you. And I, I guess, Justin, there's a lot to unpack there in your question. But what I would start with is say for us, for the most part, it really is business as usual. And I, I think we're really fortunate if you look across the economy, so many different sectors have been negatively impacted by this economic crisis we find ourselves in, whether it's travel, hospitality, real estate. I mean, uh, you know, a, ver a variety of industries are obviously completely upside down. I think our thesis, which has been the same thesis for the past two or three decades, has really been what we focused on is technology innovation and this migration from businesses from offline to online, to mobile, and now so many of those companies are trying to infuse machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence into those businesses. And so this digital transformation that we've been privileged to be a part of for the last few decades, it's actually, I think you're seeing an acceleration of that for many enterprises now that they're thrown into this new world where everyone is, is distributed, um, 
it's, it's really having that sort of an impact. So I, I think for us, we're seeing our thesis being, um, I guess, benefiting to a certain degree from some acceleration. I, I would say what we're also seeing is a flight to quality. I would say the quantitatively, the number of companies that we're seeing right now is definitely decreased in the short term. We'll get to it later, but we think for a variety of reasons that's gonna increase down the road. But in the short term, we're definitely seeing a decrease of quantity, but it's really been a flight to quality. And, and I think, think about it for a second. For any of you that are on the call right now that are entrepreneurs, who in their right mind is gonna start a company today in this environment? I mean, it's so challenging, so overwhelming on so many levels. So I think for any entrepreneurs that we're typically seeing today, it's really entrepreneurs that have an incredible passion. And for us, that's a privilege you know, to have that opportunity. I just want to just to maybe take a one second to do a shout out for Moshe Bellows, who's on the call. He's my co-professor at Yeshiva University, where we've been teaching for the last couple of years. And actually, Maccabee Ventures is the uh, the full name of the seed fund that we we uh, provided really to the market to hopefully give the students at Yeshiva University an unparalleled experience and doing some early stage investing. And I would say, as a fund, we've been very active. We've already made three or four investments that have been completely virtual in this new environment. So what's changed is it maybe takes a little bit longer and it definitely is a little bit weird to be writing million dollar checks with teams that we potentially have never met. And everything is, in, is happening now distributed virtual. But I, I think for us, Bloomberg Capital, being around for decades and being very distributed as a team. I mean, I sit in New York. I spent 20 years in the Bay Area. We have offices in Tel Aviv. I've spent time there as well. You know, just this morning I was on calls with Tel Aviv and San Francisco. Last night I was on calls with China. So we live in this very new uh, economy, this distributed world, it, for the most part, hasn't changed. It's a little bit, uh, I think, unusual, and it takes some getting used to, but we think it's a great opportunity to be deploying capital in the early stage. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add, I mean, we focus on the future of work, and uh, at Bloomberg Beta, we launched our funds in 2013, the first fund, and that was the premise, and it's, uh, there's been a lot of momentum. It's almost like turbo fuel has been, you know, placed on all the things that we were hoping, you know, would start to come together in terms of people embracing uh, tools to either work remotely or collaborate better. Um, and, and, and like Bruce, I'd say for us, you know, we've always focused on seed and, and pre-seed. Maybe it wasn't called pre-seed then, but our strategy, we're now on our third fund uh, it, because we've raised uh, most recently in 2019 our third fund of 75 million, each one's been 75 million. Um, our, our, we've been pretty consistent uh, in, in our approach. I'd say the one area that's probably opening up a little bit of a glimmer of a potentially a newer approach to things is related to geography. I mean, historically, we've uh, worked as a, a team remotely. We have offices in, in the Bay Area and also in New York. And we, for the most part, have focused on those geographies. And it's driven because we care a lot about customer service. And the thought was being closer to our founders, we can be more helpful. And then they can also have a community and be closer to each other. I, I started expanding pretty early in the time of our investing to what I called the Excella corridor. Uh, so it, it wasn't a surprise since I'm an active uh, cybersecurity investor. I was spending a lot of time in DC. And you know, since we care, uh, one of our early themes that we were interested in was around machine intelligence and AI. So I also spent a lot of time in Toronto. Now I see that um, we have to make a lot more concerted effort to uh, facilitate communities online. And I, it's, it's a new skill I think we're trying to get a lot better at. And you know, because customer service now means Zoom calls or uh, other types of you know, text message, Slack, et cetera, I, I, you know, there's nothing to say that we couldn't work with people who are potentially in other geographies in a similar type of fashion. So, so kind of picking up on, on that theme in terms of you know, going from clustered areas to now kind of being so spread out and having to deal with different communication methods, how are you finding you know, certain, we can get to industries in, in a second, but certain maybe portfolio companies that you were very bullish on that I suppose you would probably still have to be bullish on, but uh, that, that you, you may not see or adapting as well. Uh, as others, you know, what kind of advice are you giving them? Uh, and, um, you know, how are you suggesting that they, you know, frankly, adapt better when no one can necessarily see the end of this, so to speak? 
I mean, I'll say that advice is always very nuanced. It depends on who you're giving the advice to. I, I, I try to shy away from one size fits all kind of guidance. Uh, what I will say from, you know, my experience working with the SoftBank portfolio, I joined in April 2000, a uh, SoftBank, and they had something like 300 companies spread across the globe. And a large part of my responsibility was doing triage to help people figure out how to, you know, make the runway last and how to survive. And the winners of that time period did three things. Um, they, they made their operating runway last as long as possible. Uh, they secondly prioritized uh, with a mindset of scarcity. And then third, they acted very decisively with limited information. And when you look at today's uncertainty, it's just unprecedented. You know, the, the people that uh, I've been impressed with, uh, some of our founders, just because they've moved so swiftly and, and just said, this is where I think I need to be. And then they're adjusting uh, real time. And so I, the advice we're mostly giving is, is to how to navigate and how to be resilient. And then the other piece that I'd uh, recommend for anyone who has teams that they're, they're working with is just we all see it. This is really challenging. I mean, hardly, starting a company is hard enough as it is. And then you layer on a pandemic. You layer on some of the economic challenges. We layer on the uh, civil and uh, racial kind of injustice and, and, and unrest. And it's just a tsunami of challenges that one has to deal with. And so the other thing that we're doing, uh, and this is where I can give uh, across the board advice, is we're just trying to make sure our founders take care of themselves and their families and their teams because it's really important to have that foundation to be able to navigate through this. So, you know, I agree with Karen and Justin, <clears throat> excuse me, what I would add to that is, again, both of us, I think, have been investing for decades. So for many of our entrepreneurs, it might be their first company, and they could be a little bit of a deer in the headlights for this. For us, we've been through 9-11, Y2K, H1N1, 2008 market collapse. We have a lot of scar tissue, and thankfully, the lighting is favorable here, but we have some gray hair, some scar tissue, and we have a lot of learnings from those experiences, frankly, that we bring to our entrepreneurs. So I would say our first reaction, you know, in early March when things really uh, went uh, completely crazy was to reconnect with, we probably have historically over 100 portfolio companies that we've invested in over the last 25 years. We probably have about 60 or so that are currently active. And so really it was our team jumping on a call with every one of those companies, number one, to reassure them. And then number two, to really think through how we should be really reacting in these current, uh, in the current climate that we're in. And I think a lot of it is just tremendous luck and, and I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, mazel and, and we're fortunate, but many of our stronger companies have closed very significant rounds prior to all of this happening. So they are incredibly well capitalized. And I would say, again, some of our learnings are at the end of the day, it's when the dust settles, the person, the company that wins, that takes the market is the one that's standing and alive. And so we really tried to coach our companies to think through 18, 24, even 30 or 36 months of runway. How can we capitalize? I mean, so for example, we have one of our companies that actually, to Karen's point, is in the future of work. And we had a term sheet on the table for $50 million. Fortunately, we closed the $50 million. We had some adjustments in terms of valuation and the exact structure. It was really, relatively speaking, it was minor. And now the company has probably 40 months or more of runway. And so they're well positioned to really dominate. They've actually acquired one or two companies just over the last one or two quarters for almost nothing. So they're buying technology, they're buying people um, or customers really inexpensively. So everything is on the back end in terms of earn out, you know, for example, in terms of how they're structuring their transactions. So I think for us to really you know, have all hands on deck, spend time with each of our portfolio companies and understand how they are positioned. You know, ironically enough, we have one company called Lendio, which is an SMB marketplace. And they, I think they, um, they transacted probably in excess of $20 billion of PPP loans during this time. They were actually trying to hire like 200 people. And I mean, they're, they exploded through the roof. So for them, it was like a fire hose and just a tremendous opportunity that transformed the company. We have another e-commerce company as well that now that everyone sort of is, is stuck at home, everyone's shopping online as opposed to offline. 
they're growing more than 3x. I mean, they just got a solicited offer for another $60 million in financing last week, and they, they're profitable. I mean, they don't even need the money. Their cash position is incredible. They're probably going to finish the year close to $100 million in the bank and a highly profitable business. So there are definitely a few of our companies in our portfolio that have managed to just completely, you know, they're stallions and they're phenomenal. There are absolutely many others that we try to really coach them through sort of the emotional and, and some of the constraints that are related to the environment that we're in. And, and as always, I mean, you know, unfortunately there are some of the companies that are probably not going to survive. It's challenging. It's unfortunate. It, those are always very difficult decisions for us as investors. And we try our best to, you know, sustain. But if you look actually, you know, Justin, and I'm sure Karen knows this as well. If you look historically, really, over the last, I mean, even 100 years, this is a time where the greatest companies are being created in recessionary times. Microsoft, Facebook, Electronic Arts, um, you know, Bloomberg, in fact, you know, Michael Bloomberg, where, you know, Karen's, you know, with uh, Bloomberg Financial, is, you know, Netflix. Um, many of the companies, Disney, GE, these are all companies that are dominating their market that were started in the worst possible economies. And it gets to my earlier comment where this is not for the faint of heart. So many of the startups are just going to go home. They're not going to want to have the sort of gumption, you know, I guess for APAC, they're not going to have the chutzpah to really try to, you know, innovate and disrupt the market. And as a result of that, it's an opportunity for some of the startups in this ecosystem. We funded a company, Nutanix, in 2009 you know, post the 2008 market collapse. And it was three guys and a dog with an idea. They were a year away from product. Today, they're doing $2 billion in revenue. They're a publicly traded company that's been as, as valued as much as $10 billion in the height of the market. And so there are opportunities to really disrupt. And those are the entrepreneurs that we love to talk to, to find, to invest in, hopefully, to help them, you know, really grow their companies over the long term. So we, we try to encourage our entrepreneurs that were very patient, deliberate investors, I would say some of the things we're seeing is really doubling down on technology now because sales and marketing is really challenging and then maybe doubling down on existing customers. So if you have an existing customer that's paying you a hundred thousand, it might be a lot easier to convert them to a $500,000 customer as opposed to going out now in this virtual world and getting a new customer for a hundred thousand dollars, things like that. So I, I want to uh, go back to something you'd said previously and uh, you know, we can get back into how this compares with some of the other cycles that, uh, that you lived through as investors in the past as well, and some of the comp some of the industries that maybe you're not as uh, bullish on that you may have been a year ago or even six months ago. Um, but I, I want to go back to you know you're actively investing right now, and you've been doing that uh, over the last few months. How does that compare now um, with with the way you would historically invest, or you know meet with founders, meet with uh, exec teams, and and you know, did you think it was just going to be uh, just a short-term thing? How, what have you learned kind of moving forward? And even if we get out of this at some point, return to some sense of normalcy, uh, do, you, do you kind of anticipate taking some of those uh, best? So, I mean, sure. I mean, Karen can chime in uh, as well. I think from our perspective, again, we've probably seen that for the most part, there's a little bit more time to do your due diligence, not so much in the early stage, but maybe, in some of the A or B rounds that are getting done, which we're seeing. I mean, we're consistently seeing pretty competitive um, investment at the early stage still. So I think a lot of folks are, are at it and are seeing this opportunity, like I said, post 2008, post 2000 uh, and, and beyond. I think we're really fortunate in that our thesis of some of the areas that we've historically been focused on are really now rising up and being accelerated. So the whole, I guess, convergence of machine learning, deep learning, across the enterprise. So whether it's tooling or infrastructure to enable those functionalities, or whether it's areas like supply chain management and telehealth that are being completely transformed. I mean, people have been really suffering now with supply chain, you know, in the current ecosystem, things have just shut down. So I think that is something that's gonna dramatically change over the next 10 years. People are gonna try to find ways to be off of certain dependencies. And I think they're gonna sort of, the way we've seen the wave of FinTech for the last decade, I think you're going to see this transition from proprietary kind of legacy end-to-end -end systems and supply chain to have much more transparency, collaboration, work, workflow automation, predictive analytics, and the infusion of technology vis-a-vis -vis machine learning, et cetera, to enable some of these areas to now come into the 21st century and be effective so that they're not suffering and they're not, you know, being um, 
you know, negatively impacted in this current environment, you know, contactless payments, telehealth. Obviously, in fact, Karen, you know, through Maccabee Ventures, we're together at Tembo Health, which I think is brilliant. I mean, it's, it's really a virtual way to treat senior care citizens um, in, uh, in, you know, their senior care facilities now where you can't go and see them, obviously, with, with the situation that we're in. And in, in, in Blumber Capital, those are the areas that we've been focused on for the past 25 years. So we're continuing to see that. Um, I do think, though, what tends to happen is some of the funds are going to be sitting on the sidelines. Some of them are going to be a little bit more cautious. For us, it's trust and verify. We're being very deliberate, though, with our diligence process. And I think this virtual world, it's changed right now. We're still in, in sort of a, a shift. It hasn't settled in yet. But I, I think we're still going to see, I mean, who was it? I forget, was it Google or Facebook that announced they're not going back to their offices for like another year? I mean, I can tell you ourselves, our lease was up in our space in San Francisco, and we moved to a space that's, you know, half, half the size, and this distributed thing has worked amazingly well, you know, frankly, at the end of the day. For technology companies, I think it's more challenging for businesses that have been offline, but I think for businesses, most of our technology companies, the teams are distributed anyway. You know, in fact, I, I would say for our Israel portfolio companies, it's almost a positive because now they could be selling to JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley and Fidelity and Bloomberg, and it doesn't matter where they sit, if they're in Tel Aviv or Renano or in New York, it's the same difference. It's the same experience. So there's none of that delay now that there used to be like every two, three weeks, there was a cadence where the management team would come to the US in the early stages for meetings with customers. Now it's, a, it's 24 seven. I mean, I was on calls last night till 11 o'clock at night with China based on the time difference. And you know, you, you push a button and you're, you're in a conference call in a meeting with Europe, Israel, San Francisco. So I, I think on a certain level, this has changed. It'll be interesting to see where we ultimately settle in as a, as a world and, a, and an economy. But I think that there are a lot of benefits to the technology ecosystem. And Karen, yeah, I'd yeah it's been interesting. I, I, uh, I was just going to say, I mean, it's been fascinating how in some ways it, it, it does seem like the pace has just accelerated, especially now because you take the first couple of months, a lot of investors were spending time really going through their portfolio like Bruce and, 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 and we were doing. And and now they're kind of coming out of that phase. Everyone seems to be understanding or at least doing the best that we can under this new normal. And the pace of being able to set meetings and without that commute or transit time uh, really adds to the impact and the speed at which someone can accomplish something. And, and the thing that's been challenging for me has just been trust is so important. I mean, when we invest, we look at it really as a partnership and a relationship we're going to have for, you know, 10 or more years potentially. And so I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about how do you develop that level of trust with a founder over Zoom? Um, and and it's, it's, it's something I think we've been able to do. We've certainly made investments and, and uh, many of our companies have raised, um, which has also been remarkable. But that's one of the things I think that we've just got to continue to refine and get better at because especially as the pace of investing continues to accelerate at least, um, I, I, I've never been one for the shotgun wedding, you know, kind of situation. I'd much rather like get to know someone and build a partnership over time. And, and so I've been trying to think creatively of how to do that um, via Zoom um, with founders that we think are doing something interesting. Um, the other piece I'd note is reference checks have historically been really important to our diligence process. Now, um, without being able to meet people in person and get, get more of an instinct around that, um, you know, the number of reference checks we're doing has multiplied as well. You know, and I so, think, we'll Aaron, I would, I would throw it out. I thought it was funny. One of our portfolio companies told us they have, uh, and maybe it's going to get banned in the future, but uh, they have TikTok Tuesdays. So they try to have this uh, mm -hmm. virtual connectivity to, you know, it's really important to manage culture and build a spree decor within your organization, which becomes incredibly you know, difficult when you're completely virtual and distributed in different time zones, different cultures, et cetera. So I just thought that was a, a funny, interesting, you know, kind of water cooler moment that uh, one of our companies does that, you know, they have their little TikTok Tuesday competition to see who in the, who in the company does the best one. Maybe they'll have to switch. I think Facebook just launched a similar app if, uh, if it gets banned from our country. But, uh, you know, things like that, I think, are, are interesting as you see uh, the evolution and, uh, and how people really... Uh, I would say iterate to, uh, to, to find ways to, to innovate and, and maintain camaraderie across organizations, et cetera. But it's, it's challenging. Yeah, we made an investment in a company called uh, Icebreaker, 
uh, icebreaker video and just the numbers that you can imagine. It, what it does is it uh, almost creates happy hours for whether it be with teams or with communities that want to get to know each other. And it uh, by random nature pairs people up to have uh, group chats uh, with each other uh, via video and, and just the numbers. I mean, we're all craving that connection right now. I, 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 I similarly, my team and I, we've done no code training sessions. Uh, we've done cooking classes. We've done all sorts of things that, uh, you know, just try and shake things up a little bit because, you know, back to back Zoom calls also can be tiring. I, I saw somebody had tweeted how, how many of the most Zoom calls you can do in a day. And uh, certainly there's some, some days I feel like I'm pushing the limit on that one. <laughs> Yeah, Hopefully for everyone on this call, we're not pushing the limit and that you're finding this entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> and entertaining and informative, of course. Uh, so, uh, you know, with, with that in mind, I mean, there, there, are, there are so many different ways to kind of go from there, certainly with regard to um, specifically, what are you looking for uh, in management teams? How, you know, you, you kind of delved in a little bit, how that's changing now, how you're trying to do your due diligence. Um, are, you, are you looking for something different a little bit more now? Um, and, you know, I guess being early stage VCs, uh, angel investors, I know Karen is a, uh, is a term you're, you're particularly uh, uh, fond of. Um, I'm sure you say no a lot more than you say yes. What gets you both to yes and, and kind of what gets you to yes now and specifically in this environment? Yeah, Bruce, I was joking around that I like the word angel better than shark. <laughs> um, yes, but uh, in terms of uh, in terms of getting to yes, I, I, yeah, it's one of the least favorite things of, of my job is to have to tell people no. I mean, the reality is that we see thousands of companies a year and we do maybe a handful or two handfuls of, uh, of founders that we end up deciding to work with. And so, yes, it, it, that's probably the most challenging aspect is is having to say no, especially given that we know how much hard work goes into starting and building a business. Um, and, and I'd say that's the differentiator that kind of puts somebody uh, into the zone of somebody that we want to work with usually is when, when we can kind of see that grit and that tenacity um, that they're going to be able to, you know, like, look, this is an example. Who would have thought that if you're building a company, you're going to have to figure out how to have everyone work remotely, how to, you know, worry about whether the elevators are going to be safe for your employees to the extent they want to come into the office, you know, keeping team culture together. And yes, all the while making sure you're, you know, uh, getting enough revenue to fund payroll and, and, and new customers, you know, meeting their requirements in order to keep growing the business. I mean, it's just uh, what, what used to be a pretty challenging job, I think, has gotten, you know, demonstrably harder. And so seeing that somebody's going to be able to um, navigate through that is really important to us. And then we look for a special insight. Like somebody sees the world a little bit differently and believes that something needs to exist. And so those have been the kind of um, things that stand out. And then it goes back to that level of trust. I mean, we're a pretty transparent firm. We put our operating manual on GitHub and we, we will tell you everything in there from how we work with founders to the companies that we back to, you know, what our diligence process looks like and the like. And we want to be able to have those kind of conversations with founders when the going gets tough or when things are going well to really know what's going on in the business and be here as a sounding board for them. So we're also looking to see that we can develop that kind of partnership with a founder as they build their businesses. Yeah, I mean, Justin, I would, I would echo everything Karen said. I mean, the one thing I would, <clears throat> and we've, I think we've written some blogs on this is basically we refer to it as the six T's and that really hasn't changed. And that's really what we look for. And it, it's team, uh, it's theme, terrain, technology, traction and terms. Those are basically the six T's. And if I had to synthesize it down, especially Karen being super early stage investors that we are, you know, many of our companies that we invest in, they have no product, they have no customers, they have no revenue. It's really challenging to do some of that analysis. So number one, it's really so much of it is about the team. It's, it's are these, you know, our team literally, we say, do we believe that this is a team of rock stars or potential rock stars that can just disrupt a given market, number one? And then number two, again, I would say just some of my learnings from doing this for decades would be at the end of the day, it really helps when you're investing into a trillion dollar market, you know, not just a multi-billion dollar market, but 
one of the things I love, for example, about fintech, you know, we have a company that's doing this year, they're probably going to do between five and $10 billion in transaction volume. Their competitors don't even know who they are. They're still tiny relative to the market. And they're a highly profitable business, you know, north of $100 million in revenue. Like this is already a potential unicorn. In contrast, let's say to another area that I do love and that we heavily invest in cybersecurity, but cyber tends to be much more niche. It's really challenging for companies to break out. And you don't see often companies that exceed that billion dollar you know, market cap in cybersecurity. So it is a different animal. But uh, again, I would say at, at the core, you know, we really love um, number one, you know, teams that we think are rock star teams, and number two, super, you know, large market opportunities, tens of billions, hundreds of billions, or trillions of dollars. And then, you know, I, I think for us, it's it's as as Karen touched on as well. This is a really long journey together, especially in these difficult times. So in this virtual world, it's even more challenging. But it's really like a marriage. There's no divorce. We encourage our entrepreneurs to do you know, due, due diligence is bi-directional. They should really do their due diligence on us as well. And one of the things we do that's been really impactful that still serves us well in this uh, crazy world is we've launched something called a CIO council. These are chief information officers at about 150 of the global 500, you know, global 2000 companies. And these are folks that run innovation and technology for companies like Morgan Stanley, Johnson & Johnson, uh, Dignity Health, Delta Dental, or Dignity Health is now a common spirit um, through a, a merger. Uh, companies like that. And what we do is whenever, and this is typically we're investing in enterprise infrastructure, B2B types of opportunities. So we typically will send off an email to, you know, many dozens of these council members as part of our diligence process when a company is pre-product and pre-revenue. And we'll, we'll basically say, here's the problem, here's the solution, is this a nice to have? Is this a must have? You know, how compelling is this opportunity? I'm sure, you know, Karen can probably leverage the Bloomberg ecosystem on her side. And uh, for our side, we built out, you know, again, this 150 network of CIOs that are invaluable. And many of them turn into the early design partners, the first customers, advisors, sometimes even board members to companies that we invest in. And we leverage that ecosystem and network, which is it's an incredibly virtuous ecosystem. And it's relationships that we've had for dozens of years, and it's proved to be invaluable for us. So, for example, some of the first customers I mentioned before, Nutanix, which was a seed investment of ours in 2009 that went public in 2016, their first customers came through our council of CIOs. One or two of our CIOs are actually still sitting on their advisory board at Nutanix, you know, helping the company, even though today they're still a public company doing a few billion dollars in revenue. So it's those types of relationships that are now more important than ever because we're in this virtual world. So yeah, and, I, and one thing I'm just going to add real quick on the Bloomberg relationship. So Bloomberg's our LP. Um, one of the areas we actually don't focus on is financial services. Um, we did that because we don't want to potentially overlap with Bloomberg's customers. So um, we are able to, I think it is an extra superpower in the sense that Bloomberg has an exceptional machine learning team or data science, you know, organization. Um, they're very thoughtful when it comes to people. And so um, to the extent uh, founders are okay with it, we will introduce Bloomberg as a potential customer, but we do keep our worlds a little bit separate. And then one more thing I was thinking about um, as, 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 as Bruce was talking about, you know, the team aspect, um, I, I'm, I'm also very curious to see, you know, it used to be I'd hear friends who were investors talk about, well, can I envision this founder standing up before an all hands meeting in a huge auditorium. And that was one of the proxies on, on how they thought about the potential leadership of, of the, the founder that they were speaking to. I'm interested in seeing, my sense is a new form of leader is going to emerge. Just because it, it, this resiliency, this need to act more collaboratively, this distributed aspect of things, uh, I'm really curious to see how the world evolves and if we end up with a, a bit more diversity around leadership as a result of this, just because there's new skills that are needed in order to effectively take a company. So it's one of the things I was thinking about that's a kind of a new criteria that I'm kind of working to, which is how do I think this person's going to be in terms of managing a team that's, you know, a lot more complicated uh, potentially as it grows. So I, I just want to shift gears uh, just slightly um, uh, and, and make sure we have enough time for 
uh, Q&A in a few minutes. So if anyone has any uh, questions for uh, Bruce or Karen, please, by all means, um, uh, send those in. Uh, but I want to shift gears just a little bit to, uh, to touch on Israel uh, for, for just a second. Um, the, uh, there was a recent Forbes article, uh, and this might skew the way some people vote uh, in the poll that we launched earlier. Funding in the Israeli tech sector is actually up 40% from the end of Q2 last year. Uh, and if you compare this with uh, North American investments in startups, which are actually down 10% uh, compared to the same period in 2019, European venture funding down 20%. What is it about Israel? I mean, you, you both have been uh, in, investors for a long time. I know it's the $64,000 question. Is it something in the water? What exactly, uh, what exactly is it? And how, is, how are they so poised to come out possibly maybe ahead uh, in this crisis? Sure, I'll jump in and, and Karen could obviously, um, you know, comment as well and maybe even disagree. So we could have some, uh, a little tension at the, uh, uh, on, the, on this uh, session. <clears throat> You know, I, I would say it's really interesting time. And to me, what's amazing is just in the last quarter, Justin, we have a half a dozen of our companies, five out of six of those companies were Israeli. That raised $300 million in, in venture funding. Some of you may have seen or may be familiar with Biocatch, a behavioral biometric company that we were seed investors in. And they raised $145 million led by Bain Capital. Uh, we have literally just last week, four companies uh, that got some unsolicited preemptive term sheets for another $100 million in financing for, again, three out of four of those companies, um, Israeli companies. So I, I think we're definitely seeing a phenomenon. <clears throat> I would say my partner, David Blumberg, his mentor was a gentleman, some of you might know by the name of Fred Adler, <clears throat> who ran a venture firm called Adler and Company in New York back in the 70s and, and into the 80s. And they used to ask him the same question. And he, he said, there's three reasons why Israel has been unbelievable and even still today, and I think going forward, will continue to be. He said three reasons, just like real estate, brains, brains, brains. And so I, I do think that there's really truth in that. And um, I was actually talking with my Israel team uh, before this call, Justin, and I don't know if some of you know this, but I thought this was really fascinating. But apparently due to certain threats in the North and due to COVID-19, the Army, the IDF, is actually making major cutbacks in terms of actual headcount. And they're actually planning to spend a lot more on equipment, um, you know, in the field and stuff like that. So our prediction is actually that over the next six months, we're going to see a massive amount of talented 8,200, Mamram, you know, uh, 82, 81 unit people leaving the army as a result, as a result of some of those headcount cutbacks and innovating and starting companies. Number two, the other thing that I thought was fascinating that uh, my team mentioned was and again, some of you may be familiar with this, but the government in Israel declared that by 2026, they're moving the IDF intelligence offices to the south. And what's going to happen is <clears throat> a lot of talented folks are not interested in moving to the south. If, for those of you that have spent time there versus Tel Aviv, so I think many of the top, top, you know, intelligence folks are going to leave the army and then they're going to innovate <clears throat> and start companies as well. So while it's actually, again, I think from a, a quantity perspective, we've seen a bit of a, a, a bump down over the last couple of months because of the reasons we've talked on, quality-wise, it's been fantastic. And I, my prediction is over the next six to 12 months, we're going to see phenomenal quality deal flow out of the Israeli ecosystem that we're hopefully poised to, uh, to attack and, and, and jump on. And uh, we, listen, I, we've been investing in Israeli technology for over 20 years, approaching almost 30 years. And to me, it's unbelievable. I, I, don't, I don't see anything really disrupting that. I, I think, and in fact, the point I mentioned earlier, Justin, of the fact that everyone is virtual now in Tel Aviv is much less of a difference. So it used to really be you had to sort of cross the Atlantic, the Pacific from different regions, you know, to really get to Silicon Valley, to get to New York, which is financial services. And that's just gone away. So I think that will also incredibly benefit the Israeli entrepreneurs in the early days as they try to launch their companies. And I agree, I agree with Bruce. I mean, that to me is like a, a game changer in the sense that not only on the investing side, but also on the customer side, like getting access to people. It, they don't know where you're Zoom calling from necessarily. And so to the extent people are willing to change their hours a little bit, I think there's a there's a, a 
a lot of opportunity ahead. The other thing that we talked about is the importance of resiliency and just <laughs> by nature, uh, you know, Israelis, uh, uh, you know, seem to be more resilient, you know, than, than, than most. And so I think that really goes, uh, you know, to ex- uh, starting a company sometimes is easier than I, I would think is easier than serving in the military and, and some of the things they have to go through. So, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, we certainly love uh, people who come out of uh, out of, of that training. You know, and, and one thing more I would add, Justin, is I, I think we're actually going to see the trend of decreasing salaries for the reasons I've touched on before. One of our colleagues that sits in my Tel Aviv office, she ran HR recruiting for the 8200 unit. She has a CRM system of about 4,000 alumni that are distributed across the globe. She's constantly working with portfolio companies, placing some of those amazing, talented engineers across our portfolio of you know, 60 plus active companies. And I think the trend though of more people coming out of the IDF, for better or for worse, but I just think it's gonna be the reality with the migration south as well as some of the cuts they're doing on headcount. I think that uh, innovation is going to go up and salaries are going to go down. And I guess I would, I would not to beat the drum over here more, but I'm incredibly sanguine and think that we're going to see phenomenal innovation over the next uh, you know, few years uh, continuing to come. And the final piece, which again, not so much that it's time sensitive to today, but when you think about the ecosystem, I mean, just, you know, in the last, you know, uh, really, uh, couple of quarters that you have companies like Checkmarks, Armis, you know, Move It, Gilad. There's this tremendous virtuous ecosystem, which is continuing to flourish. And these entrepreneurs go off and they fund and become angel investors. Since Karen, Karen likes that word, they become angel investors, they become advisors, and they help these companies really grow and sustain. And so my other prediction is, we're going to start to see not just unicorns, but $10 billion plus liquidity events from portfolio companies coming out of Israel, because these are second and third time entrepreneurs now that are going to be much more patient. And they're not looking for the quick hit because they came out of the army, they're 29 and, you know, $20 million is life changing. I get that. Many of those entrepreneurs are coming back to us now for the second, third and fourth time. They're looking to build the next Nokia, the next checkpoint, the next Teva pharmaceutical. And so for us as early stage investors, that's incredibly exciting. I think that's what, those are some of the trends we're going to see, Justin. I, I love the, uh, I, first off, I love the um, a very optimistic outlook, uh, and I love you putting it all out on the line, Bruce. I, I really do. Uh, I, by the way, I could continue having fun with, with, with you both uh, and continue on with this, but I want to give uh, some of that love over to our audience, let them in on uh, some of the fun. Uh, so we've got a question from Harry Wernick here. What advice do you have for project managers looking for new opportunities in the tech industry? So there's a whole host of sites that have merged that are showing who's hiring and, and, and in the industry right now. So it's a great time to look for a job. And a lot of these roles are uh, potentially remote as well. So, I, I, yeah, that, that being my advice is, and I'm happy to share a list with you, Justin, if you want to pass it along of some of the co- uh, websites I've been tracking. And also, uh, we invested in a company called freeagency.com, which is kind of bringing the Hollywood style of talent management to engineers and product and product managers to uh, employees in tech. So it might be worth checking them out uh, and seeing what kind of job opportunities they can help, uh, help you find. And then just two things I would, I would add. First thing I have to, I would, I'm never going to hear the end of it, Justin, if I don't do a shout out to my dad, who's uh, in Israel at 11 PM at night, uh, looking in over here on uh, <laughs> I guess my mom had to go to bed. She was tired. Uh, it was too much, which I respect. And they've actually been in quarantine since March, since Purim. They've been uh, in quarantine, but uh, it's great to see that. <laughs> and uh, Hi, Mr. Second, you know, on, the, on, the, on the project manager side, I would say, as I mentioned before, we have a person that does all our recruiting. So if you want to send me your CV, I can share it with uh, my colleague, uh, Sharona, who does really leads all of our, our, our recruiting. We typically have between three and 500 job openings across our portfolio of companies at any given time. So nothing gives me greater joy than to try to plug someone in into one of our companies. It's a win-win situation. So I'd love to be helpful if that's possible. Yeah, and similarly, we list on our site all our portfolio companies. So if there's any that resonate, we're happy to point you in the right direction over there. 
Terrific. Okay, our next question from our old friend Adam Engel. Um, would love to hear Karen and Bruce's opinions on how startups, and Bruce, this goes to back to, to your question that you mentioned, due diligence should be done both ways, how startups should qualify the right VC for them and what's the best way to build shortlist investors that are the right fit for that specific startup. So uh, I'll jump in and Karen can obviously comment or again, I'm happy for you to Karen to disagree a little bit. Um, but um, I, I would say due diligence is bi-directional and should be in, in today's day and age, it's simple enough. I mean, everything is on social media, everything is, there's complete transparency. So it should be very easy for an entrepreneur to speak to boards we sit on, entrepreneurs we've previously invested in. We're happy to give those things as well as we progress in the process and, and of course get you know, feedback um, in that regard. So I would urge you as an entrepreneur to really look hard and closely who you're taking money from because I'll be very candid with you and, and Karen and I could probably share some of the same war stories from a board that we sat on. It's gotta be almost 20 years ago, Karen, at this point. But um, I have a blacklist of, of VCs and angels and other investors I will not invest with. And so absolutely, you should be really, I have a white list as well of people that I adore and that are a pleasure to work with. Um, the blacklist is really more painful. So you should really be thoughtful because, you know, really I, I've been on some boards that are dysfunctional and I'm sorry to say that and it's sad and it can really destroy an amazing company. So be thoughtful and deliberate. I would say the, the other maybe little nugget I would say is your opportunity to get to that first meeting at a VC goes up 10 X, like literally in order of magnitude. If you get an introduction through someone we know, a prior entrepreneur, someone we're friends with rather than a blasted email, you know, I think that again, in today's day and age, if you can't find someone that we're connected to that can send us a friendly intro email, something's wrong. And, and again, your odds of getting that first meeting probably go up about 10 X if it comes through a qualified source and through that qualified source, hopefully you can get some great feedback on the fund. Yeah, and, and I agree with, uh, of course, I, I want to try and disagree with you, Bruce, but it's just such sage Please. advice. How, can, how could I? I, 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 since this is a long-term partnership, I can't imagine, you know, not, not thinking about doing the research. And, it, you know, each investor usually makes pretty public what's their portfolio, and you should just reach out. One of the things when people ask us for references, we point them to our GitHub, you know, site and say, contact any of our founders, because that's the sh sheer sign of, what it's like to work with us is do the founders reply back, you know, and what do they say off the record? It's a lot different if we walk you to them than if you reach out to them directly. I think you should have no qualms to, like I said, or no hesitation about doing that. The other thing is there are a lot of lists that have been publicly made available of all the investors. And, and then you can start building your list as to who you think are the, the people who are going to be the most interesting. And if we started for New York, um, something that's uh, VC, it's called VC Finder that just lists uh, a lot of the uh, investors in New York. And so um, that might be a resource. It's um, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y dash um, VC uh, subtraction sign finder. And anyway, you can go there. It's open source. It gives you a list. I, I think NFX has also open sourced the list of, of VCs, but you can easily do your research. It's a lot it's a lot uh, easier to get insight into who's invested in what these days than it was, you know, 10, 20 years ago. And really, really important to do and it. You, and one follow-up point to what Karen and I have said, I would say, get a negative reference. You know, find out from a company that didn't do well. You know, just like we like to get some negative reference as well, and we like to get a 360-degree view of the entrepreneurs that we invest in, find a company that wasn't a great up and to the right success, because yeah. then you'll see the true color, frankly, of your investors. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so kind of staying on that theme, and I know you both touched on this a little bit earlier, but uh, Russ Holdstein's asking, um, it's obviously, it's great with Zoom, place no longer, uh, no longer matters. You, you both mentioned that. Um, it's a lot harder to make real connections uh, virtually and a lot harder to judge personalities. Obviously mistakes will be made uh, and, uh, and success rates for investors will suffer. What are your thoughts on kind of the overall success rate uh, in terms of kind of like batting average, I, I suppose, in this specific era? Um, and then what kind of adjustments to your due diligence uh, procedures have you made um, that you can expand upon? Sure. I mean, I, I would, I'm happy to jump in and, and Karen could obviously, you know, comment as well. 
most each of our funds typically invest in about 30 companies. And at the end of the day, for the past 25 years, historically, typically five to 10 of those companies really rise up and return, you know, a, a disproportionate amount of the dollars to get our funds to a two, three, four X kind of return. And out of the remainder, we rarely lose our money. I mean, more, more often than not, the companies, again, we're investing in technology innovation and it's really smart teams coming out of Stanford and MIT and the Technion and, you know, Yeshiva University and, and wherever else it might be. And so invariably, uh, we find those companies maybe get acquired for a one or two or three X, but that's not really the venture capital model. Our model is put in 10 million and take out 100 million on every investment. Can each investment basically return the fund or half the fund? And again, I would say historically that usually five to 10 fall into that bracket, which is incredible. And we've been really fortunate. I'd say the venture model historically is probably one out of 10 is successful, maybe even one out of 20. So thankfully our batting average has been more like one out of six, one out of seven. So maybe slightly above and we've had some strong performance, but you know, I think that's what you're gonna see. And, and again, I actually think for us, this may be one of our best performing funds and times because now we're in a very difficult environment and historically for us, those have been the best performing funds because think about it, there's gonna be a lot less Me Too competition. There's a lot less startups that are gonna tr try to compete. You're really gonna only have the best and brightest. They're gonna have the gumption to go out there and the audacity to say, I wanna raise $5 million and I wanna disrupt you know, this market of X, Y, and Z. And I'm gonna be the next Facebook, the next Google, the next you know, Cisco, et cetera. So I actually think we'll see consistent or even better numbers, frankly. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, similarly optimistic on this time. And people who are starting companies now, I mean, it's core to who they are and they just believe their business has to exist. And those are the type people, we, the founders we love working with. So, so yeah, before, now's a good time to start. Uh, so before we get to uh, some housekeeping uh, at, the, at the very end, uh, we've got one last question here from uh, Mark Zitter. Uh, does Israel's political situation, international reputation, affect the willingness of outsiders to invest? Uh, and the reverse question, does Israel's entrepreneurial success affect its international reputation and perhaps even uh, political stability as well? Uh, that's probably more in my camp than, than Karen, but obviously she can add to it, Mark. Good to see you. Um, and, um, you know, I, I would say yes and yes. I mean, I think it's always challenging. We live in a really difficult environment. I think you know, 20 some odd years ago, and you, Mark, you know me and David well for a really long time, but 20 some odd years ago when David and I were investing in Israeli technology, first off, there were very few American gringos that were going over there like we were. And, and again, David was mentored by this gentleman, Fred Adler, back in the early 80s. So he was really one of the patriarchs of early stage venture investing in Israeli technology. Most of the scenes really came on the scene in the mid 90s, you know, the Patangos, the Carmels, et cetera. That was the mid 90s when some of those folks were there. We were already there, you know, uh, David was investing in the early 80s. So going way back when. So I think we've been consistent and tried and true. And even during difficult times, during various intifadas, we've gone over there and people were, uh, candidly, like people, cab drivers, people in hotels would come up to us and say, thank you. You know, it's a, it's a dangerous time. You know, we had to sometimes shelter and, and people were really appreciative and we're Zionists, but we're fiduciaries. So we're Zionists, but we're, fiduciaries and we're investing really where we think there's unique opportunity and we can disrupt and win. And so I think the innovation is for the reasons I touched on earlier, it's not slowing down. What's interesting is 20 plus years ago, you didn't really see a lot of the Asian contingency that you saw five to 10 years ago. I think that's gonna change again, Mark, to your question, potentially because of some of the politics and things that are going on where it may be challenging for some of the uh, Chinese conglomerates and others to maybe go there, acquire, invest, et cetera. They're probably gonna find ways and partners to do that. But again, I think that still there's tremendous opportunity for early stage uh, uh, VC investment in Israeli tech. And there's a reason why people don't do it. I mean, Sequoia shut down their office there, you know, a few years ago. So many folks have tried and failed. It's really challenging. You know, it stretches my day from early morning to late night. People don't appreciate and understand the culture. They don't speak the language. You know, this is not for the faint of heart. And so I, I think it's for people that have, you know, been doing this for, like we've been doing this for many decades. I think we're onto something that's unique. There are others, of course, we're not the only early stage venture fund obviously doing this, 
but you know, many have come and go and come and gone and, and frankly been unsuccessful. And uh, for us, we've been incredibly successful. I consider us very fortunate, very blessed. And it's a privilege for us to really combine being a Zionist, but a fiduciary. And I'm most proud of the fact when my kids ask me what I do for a living, <clears throat> I tell them as we create jobs, the companies out of Israel that we've invested in have created over 30,000 jobs globally. And that's what I'm most proud of. 